السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا My dear viewers everywhere Welcome to another live edition of our program Ask Huda And here is a quick reminder with our uh, phone numbers and contact information beginning with the area code 002 then 0235531 alternatively area code 002 then 01005469323 whatsapp numbers area code 0013478026125 last number it's a whatsapp number as well 001361 area code then 4891503. I can also collect the questions if you're watching me live on my page, M. Salah Official on the Facebook. And on my page, you will find a link to the YouTube channel as well for the reference, whichever way is easier for you uh, as uh, a media platform. Uh, we have some pending questions from the last episode. Send us from Germany. Uh, Sister Sundus asked about the student loan in Germany, uh, which they don't pay back after graduation uh, uh, until they get a job and they still have some loans that they pay back half of it with zero interest. Any loan from a Muslim, from a non-Muslim, from a government, from any firm, from uh, an NOG, a non-profit organization, if they give the students or those who are in need a loan which is interest free, enjoy it. It's halal. Provided in Islam, we only take a loan whenever it is necessary. We don't take a loan for leisure to exchange the car to a newer model. Now I want to study medicine. I don't have the means. I cannot pay the tuitions on my own. The government provides you with a student loan and uh, when you pay off after you graduate and you get a job, you don't have to pay interest. Enjoy it. It's 100% halal. The problem is whenever you have to pay interest. Of course, interest-based loan is riba. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Khadija from Malaysia. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead, Sister Khadija. Welcome to Ask Wada. Okay. Uh, Sheikh, my question is, uh, can one make a tilawa sujood without the head covering? Okay, that's a good question. Thank you, uh, Sister Khadija. And uh, then my my second question is, mm -hmm. if one takes uh, allowance from his employer, maybe, uh, for example, the allowance is meant for maybe wardrobe allowance, furniture allowance, or maintenance allowance, or something like that, but you use it for something else. Are, uh, are you committing, is one committing anything by doing that? Okay, you said that he takes an allowance from his employer. His employer is giving you this allowance for... Sorry? Okay, uh, say that again, you said... Yeah, uh, the employer gives... The, 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 yes, the, the employer gives a wardrobe allowance maybe once in a year or furniture allowance, but one takes the allowance without using the money for that same purpose. Okay. All right. Got your question, Sister Khadija. Barakallahu fiki. Um, with regards to the first question, as you know that there is a difference of opinion whether sujood tilawa requires tahara or not. And sujood tilawa isn't uh, a salah, and that's why those who say it doesn't require tahara at all, they say even women during their menses can make sujood tilawa upon re reciting or hearing a reciter who recites an ayah which have sajda and the reciter makes sujood so the audience too should make uh, sujood in this case 
even if they don't have wudu, and if this is the case, and if it doesn't count as a prayer, then hijab is not required. You fall in prostration immediately without hijab, based on the view that says that it is not a prayer, and it doesn't even require tahara. Barakallahu feekum, uh, Sister Khadija from Malaysia. If an employer gives a grant to his employees annually for health reasons, for furniture, for leisure, for vacation, and you use it for otherwise, it's halal based on the fact that it's a gift. But he has to name it or name a purpose for which it is given an allowance. Unless if this allowance is related to something that would serve the job. Like he's given you an allowance to take a training or a course in order to improve your skills at work. Then you cannot spend it otherwise. You have to attend this course and you have to show that the allowance was spent in that course. But as an employer, I say to my employee, uh, you know, this is the beginning of the scholastic year. I'm giving you a thousand uh, bucks in order to buy clothes for your children, um, you know, uh, school tu tuitions or clothes or school supplies. But he was in need for the thousand uh, dollar to pay towards medication or whatever other purpose. It's halal. I'm just giving it to you as a gift. Then you may dispense it whichever way you like as long as it is a permissible way. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Afridi, assalamu alaikum Afridi. Wa alaikum salam Sheikh. How are you? May Allah increase your haya and individual to do deeds. Barakallahu feek. Go ahead. What is your question today, Afridi? Yes. If I am on praying Sunnah of Fajr and Imam comes and he starts congregational prayer, then what should I do? Should I continue my Sunnah prayer? Or leave Sunnah and catch Imam? Okay. That depends. And Afridi. another question. Mm. Go ahead. Uh, do you run your page M Official Salah by yourself? <laughs> I'm sorry? Do you run your page M Salah Official by yourself? Okay. Okay. I will answer do, uh, that too as well. Barakallahu feek, Afridi. If you're praying Sunnah al Fajr, which is the most emphatic Sunnah of all the Sunnah, uh, we spoke about its virtues and we said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the two rakahs of Sunnah before Fajr are better than the whole world and what it contains. Before Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is such a great thing to offer and uh, for the believer who offers those two rakahs it is better than gaining and earning the whole world and what it contains. If you start the Sunnah and the Iqamah is called there is a great possibility that you will miss the rakah. in this case you step out of the prayer, you take off, in order to join the faridah. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, إِذَا أُقِيمَةِ الصَّلَاةِ فَلَا صَلَاةَ إِلَّا الْمَكْتُوبَةِ Whenever the iqama, which is a call to establish the congregational prayer, is called or established, then one shouldn't offer any other prayer but the current mandatory prayer. But, if the person was close to finish the two rakahs, then finish the two rakahs and combine the two goodness. Pray the two rakahs and attend the prayer of the Fajr Jama'ah in congregation from the beginning. But you just started the two rakahs and you know that it will take you five minutes, seven minutes, and there is a possibility that the Imam will finish one rakah or you would rush in order to, or hasten in order to catch the rakah of the Imam. So the fard, is worthy, more worthy. You leave the sunnah, you pray the jama'ah with the imam, then after the fajr, you have the choice of praying the two sunnah to make it up after the fajr prayer. Or you wait until it is past sunrise and you can pray it as qadha. Barakallahu feek. Um, the question concerning my Facebook page. I look into the questions and I do my best to answer some of the questions because they are really beyond my capacity to answer all of them. It's only one person. And as I mentioned before that I only have one person who's doing everything here at the channel in the prep department and taking the questions and the calls and so on. It's, it's really, it's a big task and it requires a huge team. We don't have an access to have such team. 
So the viewers, the followers of the page, uh, sometimes after the prayer, I'm sitting in the masjid and I answer questions. I don't even have the time to type, so I answer audio files and I send uh, the uh, audio message to, <coughs> to the questioners. And many of the questions we answer during the live show. And sometimes I make uh, a live broadcast, maybe from home or here or at the airport to answer some of those uh, questions to the best of my ability, of course. Now on my page, they posted the YouTube link, which I would appreciate if you subscribe to it and spread the word so that inshallah it will be uh, activated. Sister Maya Hadi is having some questions. The first question is, <coughs> excuse me. Okay. Okay, that's Amani Santiago. Sister Amani is asking, I'm diabetic and I take insulin. <coughs> Can you tell me about fasting or not during Ramadan, please? <coughs> Excuse me. As for me, I can answer whether it's permissible to take insulin while fasting or not. That is permissible. So if you have to take insulin while fasting, take it. And would that invalidate fasting? No. As for the part whether should you fast or not, that is totally the decision of your doctor. Um, you know, a trustworthy Muslim doctor would say, you know, a professional doctor. He would say that, as a matter of fact, your type of diabetes doesn't, you know, uh, affect your fasting, or fasting would not uh, have any conflict with the type of diabetes you have. As a matter of fact, it may improve uh, your health condition, fine. But if your doctor said, look, you're diabetic, I don't want you to get into hypoglycemia, so you have to break your fast, and throughout the day you have to eat some sweet or whatever, uh, or um, that, you know, on certain intervals, you have to take some medication. In this case, you break your fast and you feed one miskin, one poor person. Uh, for each day, you skip its fasting. After the day, after you broke fast on that day. Or after you skip fasting on that day. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Let's see Sister uh, Maya Hadi from the USA is saying that I know our fasting, voluntary fasting, you may break it uh, if invited. Is Mondays and Thursdays, the white days and the six days of Shawwal and the 10th of Muharram part of that? Uh, yes, it's all voluntary. So whether you're invited or whether you have guests or whether you felt like, you know what, I'm not feeling well today, let me skip fasting today. All of that is permissible because it is voluntary. Tatawa. So uh, the preference, of course, is to resume fasting. The Quran says, لا تبطلوا أعمالكم. You should not uh, void and interrupt the good deeds that you're doing or invalidate them. But is it permissible? Yes, it is permissible. And that applies to all the voluntary fasting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Nadia from Canada. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Ask Huda. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, how are you, Sheikh? I'm doing fine, alhamdulillah. Thank you, Sister Nadia. Go ahead, please. Uh, I have a question. My father passed away a couple of months ago. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. May Allah have mercy on him. Amen. Uh, so when he was in the hospital, um, uh, close to his death, uh, almost a week ago, uh, one week I was um, with him and I was putting the Surat Yasin. Mm. Uh, he was listening. But sometimes he was um, unconscious, but sometimes he was um, trying to listen. Uh, but I didn't remind him to, uh, like, say astaghfirullah or say kalima to repent. But but now he passed away. But some people are now telling me should that time close to his death was tell him like was he should tell them to like repent to Allah and say astaghfirullah or kalima. But I didn't say that. I feel now very guilty. Sister Nadia, was he conscious? Was he conscious before his death? 
He was, he had Parkinson, but mm -hmm. I was looking at him when I was putting the Surat Yasin on my phone uh, for some, like for two, three minutes, he was, um, it, it, it seems like he was listening. It seems like he was aware of something going on around. He was, but sometimes he was unconscious, sometimes not. طيب. I got your question, Sister uh, Nadia. We say that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the sound hadith which is narrated by multiple narrations and several companions that whoever's last statement before death is La ilaha illallah, he shall enter paradise. And then we have been instructed to do the kind of talqeen whenever a person is, you know, approaching death, those who are nearby, they should, uh, you know, gently remind him to say La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, or by saying it loud in his presence so that while they are visiting him so that he would pay attention to it and he would repeat it. Saying the kalima La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah is an indication of a great conclusion to one's life. When he was sick, when he was listening to the Quran, all of that is good. But also, you know, thank you for calling. And we have been talking about that in Gardens of the Pious for several weeks. But now we need to learn that whenever somebody is sick, whenever the doctors say that he's terminally ill, it's just a matter of a few days. So there are things which should be given the priority. Besides, what would you like to eat? What would you like to drink? And assuring the person and talking about dividing, you know, his wealth or, 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 or. Maintaining the iman of the person until the time of death and making certain that gently that he or she will get to say the kalima or at least hear it before you, uh, hear it from you a few times before they die. But since he died, we hope and we anticipate that Alhamdulillah he died as a believer and your dua and your istighfar for him, seeking forgiveness for him does count and it will help a great deal. So we seize this opportunity to make dua for your father, sister Nadia. We ask Allah to have mercy on him and to make his grave a garden of paradise. Amen. Uh, brothers and sisters, all of us pay attention. If somebody is seriously sick and is about to die, remember to remind him or her with the kalima, with the shahada before the death. I think sister Nadia is still on the line. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Thanks so much for your advice. Uh, my second question is if I fast uh, for him, that he will get the reward. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Sister Allah. Nadia. Jazakumullahu khairan. As far as making up the missed fasting that he missed during his life while he was uh, supposed to fast, like let's say that uh, he was traveling and he missed some days of fasting, but later on he got sick and he did not. Uh, make up the missed days. That's called qada. And when a woman came to the Prophet sallallahu and she asked him about her father who died without making up the uh, missed uh, days, he said, yes, you should make it up in his state. If the person got sick in Ramadan and he was seriously sick and he was in the hospital, then he died in this condition. He wasn't supposed to fast anyway because he died in this sickness. So you can give the fidya, it'aamu uh, miskin, feeding one poor person for each day he has skipped fasting. Would the word of fasting reach him? Absolutely. Would the word of performing hajj or umrah or giving in a charity on his behalf in his state reach him? Absolutely. Let me summarize to you brothers and sisters because we all need to hear that. We have loved ones who passed away and we want to make sure that they are receiving good deeds in their graves because we know for certain that when I die and when you die, when everyone dies, all our good deeds, all our hasanat will be interrupted. No more earning good deeds except as the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said through, through three ways. One of whom he said that when you have somebody like a righteous child who will keep making dua for you. This dua, this supplication and prayer we make for a dead person 
most certainly will benefit him. As it is stated in another hadith, when the person in the barzakh and he sees his rank in, in paradise being promoted, so he says, oh Allah, what for? I know that I haven't done anything because I'm dead. So how come I was promoted? He's asking, he wants to know, you know, how did I earn that? So the answer will be delivered to him in his grave, bidu'a'i waladikalak, because your child has been making dua for you. So brothers and sisters, if you love your parents, your spouses, your children, your brothers and sisters, your uncles and aunts who passed away, your shuyukh, your leaders, make lots of dua for them. This is guaranteed to benefit them, insha'Allah. If they were righteous, he will promote them and uh, raise them into higher ranks in paradise. If they were otherwise, he will remit some of their sins, he will grant them forgiveness, and he will give them a break. Then insha'Allah, Allah will forgive them. Likewise, giving in a charity on behalf of the dead people. And as I said before, Hajj or Umrah, even if it is uh, voluntary, if you intend to do so, instead of somebody, even a late person, is guaranteed that will benefit the dead people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all our sins. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back inshallah in a couple of minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. I think we have some callers. Saeed from Bosnia. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam, Sheikh. How are you, brother Saeed? Alhamdulillah, good. How are you? Wonderful. Great. Go ahead. Yes, my question is if somebody, let's say my cousin, my brother, somebody plays the lottery and wins the lottery, and obviously it's haram to play it. Am I, Saeed, can you raise your voice, money, please? If he wants to give me some money from that win, from he won from the lottery, is it haram for me to take it or am I allowed to, to take it? So he works in the lottery. Hello? Yes. Your friend who wants to give yes, you the you money, my question? he's working in lottery. Yes. Okay. And he's giving you the money as a loan or as a grant? No, he just uh, won, let's say, 100,000, and he wants to give me 10,000 just to give me, to no loan, nothing, just to give it to me. Okay, uh, you'll hear the answer now, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Um Muhammad from the UK. Um Muhammad, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead, please. Uh, um, salam alaikum, brother. Sorry, I can hear my voice. I'm not sure if you can hear double. I hear you. Go um, ahead. First of all, um, brother, uh, I that you are well and uh, your team are all in the best of iman and good health, inshallah. I mean, same thing. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to... Um, um, First of all, thank you for your answer that you gave a couple of weeks ago. I called with regard to um, sort of the Islamic view on homeschooling um, and uh, Jazakallah khair for your answer. Um, I'd just really like to like to say um, that I hope for, for my benefit and the, the benefit of others hoping to do the same, that Allah will give us strength to, to make this step and do this if we think that this is the best thing for our children and that inshallah we can give them the right future that will bring them closer to Allah. Amen. 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 Um, but today's question, uh, Sheikh, um, I'd like to ask, I don't know if you were aware, but here in, um, in England, uh, in come next year in September, um, the, government, the government are looking at making it compulsory to teach um, children relationship education um, from, from primary school, from the age of four, which involves them having knowledge of... Um, LBG uh, gen type people, lesbian, gay, and uh, transgender people, mm. um, and basically they're going to make this compulsory so that we can't take our children out of these lessons if our children are in school. Um, I, I, I just like sort of your opinion, really, on how we, as parents, as Muslim parents, can um, 
approach our schools with the with knowledge of how uh, what we believe is correct and not and and the best way to do that really um and also how we as parents at home can talk to our children about what they're hearing at school and and uh, um for our, our view islamically uh, okay yeah i got you your question sorry, sister Sheikh. I got your question, sister. Yes, sorry. Um, and uh, Sheikh, are you still there? Yes. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Question, um, um, Sheikh, is um, for us as Muslims, for example, if we encounter people who are um, either lesbian, gay, or trans, and uh, we want to give them some advice uh, if they're willing to listen, for example. Uh, obviously, if we're speaking to Muslims of this sort, we, we have the knowledge that Allah wants us to keep away from this type of behavior and we have uh, lots of things we can say. Uh, what about when dealing with non-Muslims? What sort of advice would you say that we could, what sort of things could we say if, if the person seems like they want to listen or we want to help them in any way? Okay, thank you. Jazakumullah khairan on Muhammad from the UK. Abu Aisha from Sudan. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan ya Sheikh. May Allah reward you for the good work, inshallah. Ameen. Ameen. Thank you, Abu Aisha. Go ahead. MashaAllah. Yeah, um, my first question um, deals with one of the phrases that you see very often now on the social media RIP, rest in peace. Um, should we say that for our this is uh, Muslim brethren? Okay. R.I.P. For example, I lost an uncle, I lost somebody, a loved one, and then friends will be commenting R.I.P. Okay. The second question is, um, when the people pass away in the military or in uniform, normally they do um, a 21 gun salute for them. Should this be done for a Muslim? Okay. Thank you very much, Yasser. Got your questions, uh, brother Abu Aisha from Sudan. Uh, Masha'Allah, brothers and sisters, you keep asking me all the troubling questions today. What is going on? Huh? You want to put me in trouble? Go ahead. Abu Safwan from Kuwait, and um, I'm sure he's having another some troubling questions too. Abu Safwan, Assalamu Hello, alaikum. Hello, Salaam Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam, Abu Safwan. How are you? Alhamdulillah. How are you, Sheikh? Wonderful. Alhamdulillah. Wa shukurillah. Okay. Okay. I have some political questions, but I will not. I told you. Or rather, it is purely. Yeah, I told you. Yeah, go ahead, religious. Abu Safwan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, you see, one is that my first question is, Sheikh, um, may Allah protect you and all, all the Muslims, inshallah. So I have a friend, he's Qadiani. You know, in Pakistan, there is a sect. They yeah. don't believe in Prophet Sallallahu as the last and final messenger, <coughs> but they have a false, yeah. you know, prophet. He is my friend. Obviously, you know, they are a sect. So can we keep friendship with them? We know that, obviously, we don't believe on each other's beliefs. We don't follow. But can we invite them on uh, some, you know, uh, some, you know, kind of gatherings or uh, uh, dinners or we can join them. This is my first question. Okay. Second question is, uh, like this, you know, there's a ayah, you know, in the Manistata Ilahi Savila. People generally, they expect some donation for going Hajj and Umrah. So is it is it permissible or it is uh, okay? Because, you know, it's not a compulsion on them. It's not compulsory. If they can't afford, they can't go. But generally, people, they go with uh, their other donations. Mm. So, and the third thing is, um, uh, which have more reward? You know, if we are giving, you know, performing Umrah third, fourth, fifth time, or uh, giving the similar amount which we spend on Umrah in a charity. So these are my three questions. And instead of going for Umrah, you spend the same amount in, in, in charity, right? Yes, yes. Instead of Umrah, going for Umrah. All right. Okay, Sheikh. Thanks, okay. Lord. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. 
Brother Mohammed from Poland. Mohammed, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. How are you, brother? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead. Uh, brother, I have a question. Um, it's, it's, it's regarding uh, some people um, given a Christianity case when they come to Europe. Hmm. But the thing is, I know a brother that he's given us to become asylum for Christianity, but in the heart he's still a Muslim. Mm. He still prays, he still fasts, but just for the paperwork, he's reverted, uh, like he said, he's Christian. So I want to know what is your advice for those brothers. Okay. All right. Muhammad from Poland. Sister Aisha from Ethiopia. Assalamu alaikum. Aisha, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum. Yeah, go ahead, Sister Aisha. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. How are you doing? Wonderful. Alhamdulillah. Go ahead. What is your question, Sister Aisha? Uh, it's about uh, Ramadan. I haven't been able to fast uh, two consecutive Ramadan. Mm. Uh, two years back in last year. Mm. And my question is, uh, uh, two years back, I, I gave birth, so I wasn't able to fast. Mm. And one month after that, I was diagnosed with stroke. Mm. So I wasn't able to repay it. Mm. So now, Alhamdulillah, Allah has given me Shifa. MashaAllah. And I have finished uh, to repay last year's Ramadan. No. But should I repay to the two years back Ramadan? Because uh, at that time, I wasn't able to fast. I was sick, so I gave uh, food for the masakin in re the replacement for the Ramadan that I didn't fast. Now, should I fast it or how shall I? Okay, I got your questions, sister. Aisha, um, I would kindly request you to put a hold on your phone calls because, mashallah, I have many questions and I will be traveling tomorrow. So I would like to wrap up those questions before. And I, I don't know, somehow, every time I'm traveling, I get some troubling questions. And uh, mashallah, that leads to stopping me at the airports and giving me a hard time. Sometimes they keep me for hours and hours to, you know, why did you answer this kind of answer? This is something I would not change. Alhamdulillah wa shukrullah. And I hope and I pray that Allah the Almighty will keep us all steadfast. Being in this position and answering those questions, Wallahi, it's a big, big, big responsibility. You know, you would rather work in a clinic or teaching math or pharmacology or whatever and not bear the responsibility of giving an answer. You know, when you make a mistake, that is something. But when you give a wrong answer deliberately, it's a big mess. So the person goes astray and he misleads others. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to what is best. If Allah have tested me and put me in that position to answer those questions, so I have one of two choices, either to give the answer which I believe is correct or to abstain, but not to give a politically correct answer and say it is okay because I'm traveling and um, I may be exposed to some harm or danger or whatever. So may Allah guide us to what is best. Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Let's see. Uh, Brother Saeed from Bosnia. Somebody who is working in lottery. In haram, gambling. You know, lotto tickets is a form of gambling. And its earning is absolutely haram. What is the difference? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمْ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنَّمَا الْخَمْرُ وَالْمَيْسِرُ وَالْمَيْسِرُ الْمَيْسِرُ Gambling. وَالْأَنْصَابُ وَالْأَزْلَامُ رِجِسٌ مِّنْ عَمَلِ الشَّيْطَانِ فَجِتَنِبُوهُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So it is absolutely forbidden. Lot of tickets absolutely forbidden. And the earning as a result of that is as bad as riba. Exactly. It's haram earning. And uh, I just remembered once after I gave the khutbah, in my uh, center in, in the States. 
an old fellow approached me and he said, son, I love you so much. And uh, every time I buy a lotto ticket, I pray that, oh Allah, make me win one million dollar so that I would give you half of this amount, 500,000 for you. So I smiled to him and I said, why uncle? He said, because you're a good man. I want you to support your da'wah work and to spread your da'wah. So I spoke to him gently and I explained to him that Allah the Almighty is good and he only accepts that which is good. If you earn one million out of haram and you donate, you donate 900,000, you give them in a charity for good causes, that would not make the remaining 100,000 legitimate or halal for you. The entire amount is haram. And that would not release you from the prohibition of being indulged in something which is haram. Brothers and sisters, Allah said, Fajtanibu, avoid it. Don't go near it. So one of the reasons some of the brothers who used to work in selling lotto tickets and beer and uh, alcohol have quit this job. Whenever they invited me to their houses, I refused to drink even water. They said, you care for some juice? No. So why do you visit them? I will tell you because Abu Safwan have asked a question which I would need to join the two questions now so that I will give you the, the answer uh, to the two questions together. Food? No. Drink? No. At least you want some water, uh, Sheikh? I'm okay. But we're visiting. I'm still visiting them because I know that we need to visit them. We need to come close to such people. We need to give them da'wah. Until, alhamdulillah, all the Muslims in the city that we lived in who used to run convenience stores, sell lotto tickets, beer, tobacco, and other stuff have quit. Pork and uh, pepperoni and all of that, they have quit. They sold their businesses, they got rid of it, and they changed their careers by the grace of Allah. So one of them said that, I will never forget that every time you come to my house, you even refuse to drink water. So I figured that when you leave, I tell my wife that, this is what he says, that we, we speak about the sheikh refused to drink water in our house because he knows that our earning is from haram. So it was very painful, but we got it. We learned the lesson. The Prophet ﷺ said, one of the means and one of the ways of changing what is evil is by your heart. And that is the weakest. The strongest, if you have the power, the authority to stop it, you should. You should do so. If not, then by preaching. If you're not able to do that, at least by condemning it by your heart. So you know that the person is earning from haram and he's giving you 10 grams and say, oh, thank you so much. I love you for the sake of Allah. No, I don't love you for the sake of Allah. I will love you for the sake of Allah when you quit the haram. Don't give me the 10 grams. Don't take the haram. You know one thing I want to share with you, brothers and sisters, that to avoid earning a single dollar from haram is better than giving a million dollars in a charity from halal. Shall I say that again? Okay. You have huge amount of fun from halal. You want to give them in a charity. Of course you will be rewarded for that. But a greater reward lies in avoiding earning a single dollar from haram. So avoid the haram that is healthier, that is better for you in this dunya and in the hereafter. Brother Saeed, don't take that grant, that gift from the brother whom you know for certain. He earns a law for you. He wants to give you some to legitimize his earning. That will not make it legitimate. And avoid the haram since you already know that his earning is pure haram. If a, if a beggar, if a miskin, and somebody give him money, and this person, subhanAllah, uh, is a Muslim or non-Muslim, his earning is haram or halal, it doesn't concern him because he doesn't know. It's halal for him. But for you, this is a sign of telling him, my brother, I fear for you. I want you to quit the haram. You know, I'm not interested in this money. May Allah bless you. Even though I need it desperately, but I would rather ask you to quit earning from haram and quit dealing with lottery. Um, the second question, Amu Muhammad from the UK, about, you know, the mandatory teaching of... Uh, relationships in schools. This is really weird. And this is pure dictatorship. 
a few years ago, you know, any of these relationships, homosexuality was illegitimate. You know, 20, 25 years ago in the States, if they find out you're having such relationship or you're having such tendency, they would not just kick you out of the army, but even Boy Scouts, you know? But now they impose it on people. I'm afraid that in a few years it will become compulsory that you should have such a relationship. The Almighty Allah says in the beginning of Surah An-Nisa, Ya ayyuha nasu attaqu rabbakum. O mankind, believers and non-believers, Muslims and non-Muslims, keep your duty to your Lord, fear your Creator. Alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidatin, wa khalaqa minha zawjaha. وَبَثَّ مِنْهُمَا رِجَالًا كَثِيرًا وَنِسَاءً وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ What is the purpose? Why Allah created Hawa for Adam? Huh? In order to spread this generations after generations, the offspring. صح? Correct? That is the purpose. But when a man marries a man, when a woman marries a woman, that defeats the purpose. In Islam, and my duty as a professor of fiqh, of aqidah, of comparative fiqh, of comparative religions, is to tell you that in Islam, as well as in Christianity, as well as in Judaism, it is absolutely forbidden to have such relationship. It's a major sin. This is in our religion. And this is in every religion that a prophet from Allah had been sent to preach. So there is no such thing, and it is perceived you know, outside marriage relationship between a man and a woman is perceived as zina, adultery, and fornication. And Allah said in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina." Don't you go near adultery. Don't you approach it. And furthermore, a relationship between the same gender in Islam is absolutely forbidden. I happen to have a delegation from several European countries. They sat with me for six hours or more. Want me to say one word. It's okay, you can be a good Muslim and have such a relationship. There is no way that I could have said that. Unless if I want to change my religion. The Quran forbids such a relationship. So even if you teach the children in a school, as if it is compulsory, as you're saying, I will keep telling my children that this is not permissible. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes for that. It has nothing to do with any religion. Religions oppose that. Religions spread modesty, chastity. You like a girl, propose to her, marry her, have goodly offspring out of marriage, out of wedding, not out of wedlock. May Allah guide us to what is best. Um, Abu Aisha from Sudan, who said, you know, when somebody dies, they say, R.I.P., rest in peace, and what do you think about that? It depends on your intention, and it's not your wish. So when somebody dies, you say, Allahumma gfillah, Allahumma arham. When you say that, uh, rest in peace, يعني, it's a supplication, if this is your intention. I hope that you're resting in peace. Because the grave which is a transient life, al-barzakh, between our worldly life and the resurrection and the hereafter. People are not just sitting there not doing anything. No. They will be either enjoying the promise of Allah, their word of paradise, as in the long hadith of al-Bara ibn Azib, when they see their place in heaven, or they will be tormented day and night. It's either a garden of paradise or a pit of hellfire, the grave. The Quran says in Surah Ghafir about the Pharaoh and his host, they're being punished morning and evening, 24-7, in the graves, even though they were not really buried. They were drowned, but their souls are being tormented every single moment, 24-7. So when you say about the Pharaoh and you go to the museum and visit his mom and you say, rest in peace, your word worth nothing. It means nothing. He's not going to be resting in peace whether you wish it or not, whether you make dua for it or not. 
So when you say that to a believer and you wish him to rest in peace and to have Allahum maj'al qabrahu rawdatan min riyad al-jannah, that is the supplication. Oh Allah, make his grave a garden of paradise. This is a valid supplication. So if you say, like, you know, commonly in English, bless you, may God bless you, rest in peace, it's okay if this is your intention. Not everything is uh, haram or forbidden. Uh, Abu Safwan, remember when I said that we visit everybody. Yes, we visit with Qadianis, we visit, we visit with Ahmadis. Um, one of the courses I teach at the university is the Muslim sects and groups. And I teach about all the various sects, Ahmadis, Qadianis, Baha'is, Alawis, Nusairis, um, uh, you know, uh, and all, all the different sects of Shia and subsects of Shia and Shiaism, Khawarij, Mu'tazila, uh, all of that. So we explain what they went wrong. And when it comes to some of those sects, they deviated from Islam to the point that they are not actually Muslims because they have a different belief. So the Quran says, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّنْ رِجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ Muhammad, peace be upon him, was just the messenger of Allah and the seal of the prophethood. If any person, if any Muslim said, yeah, I believe he was a prophet, but he was in the seal of the prophethood. Thank you so much. That is your belief and this is un-Islamic, which means you're not among Muslims. Yeah, but I like to pray or I like to fast. I don't care. This is what the Quran says. When somebody says, when somebody claims that he's Al-Mahdi, then he claims that I'm Jesus himself. Then he claims that I'm Muhammad, peace be upon him. Then I'm the, uh, the Messiah. And he keeps claiming things. And there is a prophet after Muhammad or whatever. That is contrary to our belief and aqeedah. Akhi Safwan, if somebody gave me and he says, Sheikh Muhammad, I'm inviting you for Hajj this year. I would happily accept the money and I would go for Hajj or Umrah. I would not hesitate. Whether it is Hajjatul Islam or, you know, even if it is number 20, Hajj or Umrah. Yeah, take it. It's a grant. So if somebody sends you to go for Hajj on donations or contribution or Sadaqah, accept it. And it is valid. Your hajj is accepted. And the person who donated the money for you to perform hajj will get a similar word for, of their word, uh, to the word of your hajj. Uh, his last question, uh, when he says that, um, you know, is it better to go for Umrah or to donate the money to the poor? That depends. The answer is not always the same. The answer is not always the same. Sometimes I see some cases where they are desperately in need. Take the money. This is voluntary hajj, voluntary umrah. But hajjatul islam, I have the means, go and perform your hajj or umrah. I have an orphan girl who wants to get married and uh, we're collecting fund for her. I have some money which I dedicated to go for umrah. Give her the money, buy her the appliances, you will get the reward of performing umrah and the reward of helping the girl to get married. Aisha from Ethiopia. She missed a couple of Ramadans because she was sick and previously she was pregnant. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you a quick shifa and reward you for your patience. As long as you're capable to fast now, you need to make up the missed days. It doesn't have to be consecutive as much as you can to the best of your ability. Even if it takes another year to make up those missed days and you don't have to give an extra fidya for the delay because it was out of your control. If the person is unable to fast due to the constant health issues or sickness, in this case, you resort to giving the fidya, feed one miskin per each day that you missed its fasting and the days which you will not be able to fast in the future. Muhammad from Poland, and that is the last question. Somebody claims to convert to Christianity in order to seek asylum in Holland, in Poland, or whatever. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Holland is not heaven. Poland is not Jannah. Uh, the USA is not paradise. The land of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, 
What would it take if you die in this condition? Why are you saying that I've converted? And another person says that I'm seeking asylum because I'm gay and he's not, or if he is, or whatever. Man kana akhiru kalamihi la ilaha illallah dakhala al jannah. Be honest with yourself. You're seeking asylum because of persecution in your country. Drop the papers and say, you know, this is my condition. But to claim that you're Christian in order to seek asylum or to be granted asylum isn't permissible. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to what is best. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم. I know that there are many questions which I would love to answer that I received today. Insha'Allah at the airport on my way to my next stop. I will go live and I will answer those questions insha'Allah. Until the next episode when I return back, I leave you all in the care of Allah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deeds